One of the most controversial debates raging at the moment is about the ethics of embryonic stem cell research. This debate is curiously being pitched as science versus religion. Sadly, this is unfairly simplistic assessment of the debate that has meant that any argument put forward by any Christian from the field of medical science is instantly dismissed as merely religious arguments. Therefore, what this argument is supposed to be about is often lost in the false idea that this is about religion versus science. Well, is this a debate between religion and science? No, it's a debate about ideologies. That is, ideas that shape our opinions about the world around us. It's not even really a debate between progressive science and conservative science, as we'll soon see. While it's not really a battle between science and religion, it is a very serious ethical dilemma that can possibly be presented as, which is more ethical, option one, to destroy unwanted human embryos and not use these doomed human tissue cells that could potentially save or dramatically improve the quality of a suffering person's life, or option two, to allow medical researchers to examine the potential health benefits latent within unwanted human embryos left over from IVF. This is generally how the debate is expressed because those who are religious generally regard human life as unique and a gift from God. They regard the destroying of life of a human embryo as not only morally wrong, but also ethically wrong. This contrasts by the approach of naturalists, that is atheists, who regard life as a chemical equation and the result of random chaotic evolutionary events. Well, what are stem cells? We all have stem cells. They are essentially those parts of the human body that are designed to make running repairs. When you cut your finger, stem cells get to work to repair your broken skin. But not all parts of our bodies have these stem cells, those building and repairing cells. When you think of those parts of our bodies that can repair themselves, skin, bone, muscle, it's because of stem cells. But what medical scientists suspect is that these stem cells perform an additional function in human embryos. It is believed that these embryonic stem cells have the capacity to become the building blocks of virtually any body part, including those parts that in an adult that don't ordinarily have stem or building repairing cells. It is believed that it could therefore be possible to clone specific body parts like spinal cords or brain cells from these embryonic stem cells and implant them into an adult who has irreparable body damage. Anyone who has known someone suffering with multiple sclerosis or Parkinson's disease has despaired not only at the agony these people have to endure, but at the thought that their incurable predicament can only deteriorate. There is an obvious desire to relieve human suffering and improve the quality of life for those who unfortunately lost the genetic lottery and suffer as a result. And this motivation reinforces the incredible and immeasurable value of a human life, which makes the use of human embryos ironic. When we talk about removing these invaluable and potentially life-saving stem cells from an embryo, two questions arise. Firstly, can the embryo survive if some of its stem cells are removed, that is, harvested? Secondly, assuming that embryo death results from such stem cell harvesting, in what way is this not to be regarded as the taking of a human life and therefore be considered as in utero infanticide? As we ponder these two important questions, let's consider what we mean by an embryo. On day one, an embryo is 0.1 of a millimetre, it's called a zygote. On day two, it's 0.2 of a millimetre, it's called a morella. Day 13, it's 0.2 of a millimetre and it's in placenta formation. Day 16, it's 0.4 of a millimetre and that's called neurulation. Day 18, it's one millimetre long. This is implantation. Day 20, somites appear. Day 22, neural folds and heart folds develop. Day 24, it's three millimeters long. It has initial pharyngeal arches appear. Its heart is now beating. Central nervous system is now functioning. Day 28, it's five millimeters long. Upper limb buds appear. Eyes and ears appear, the brain and spinal cord are the largest tissues of the embryo at this stage. 
Day 30, it's five millimetres long. Pharyngeal arches develop. Face and neck begin to form. Blood system is now evident. Day 35, it's seven millimetres long and the esophagus forms. Day 38, it's seven millimetres long. The cerebral hemisphere forms. Eyes begin to form. Day 40, it's 11 millimetres long. The hind brain formed, that it regulates the heart, breathing and muscle movement. And the digits, that is fingers and toes, appear. Day 43, it's 13 millimetres long. Its four-chambered heart is now formed. Facial muscles are now developing. Ears are now recognisable. The heart is functioning. Day 46, it's 14 millimetres long and the eyes are pigmented. Nipples appear, hand plates formed, kidneys are now producing urine. Day 50, it's 18 millimetres long. The first detectable brain waves are evident. The brain is now functioning. Ears now functioning to provide a sense of balance. Day 52, it's 20 millimetres long. It has spontaneous movements. The nose is formed. Nasal openings are evident. Genitals are formed, whether they be testes or ovaries, and the toes are formed. Day 53, it's 22 millimetres long. The intestines recede from the umbilical cord into the embryo. Eyes are now developed. Day 55, it's 24 millimetres long. Cartilage forming into bones. The brain can now move muscles. Day 58, it's 26 millimetres long. The head is erect and rounded. External ears are completely developed. The eyes are closed, but the retina of the eye is fully pigmented. The eyelids begin to unite and are only half closed. Taste buds begin to form on the surface of the tongue. The primary teeth are at cap stage. Bones of the palate begin to fuse. This is the end of the embryo stage. Is an embryo human? I have heard on November 30th, 2006, a member of the Tasmanian Upper House, who is unfortunately suffering from Parkinson's disease, lent his support to the quest to legalise embryonic stem cell research. His argument was that the killing of an embryo was reasonable and morally justifiable since a human embryo is not a human being. Therefore, while he stated his opposition to murder and even seriously questioned the morality of abortion on demand, he regarded the harvesting of stem cells from human embryos as perfectly legitimate, since according to his reasoning, a human embryo is not a human. The claim that a human embryo is not a human being is reasoned in several ways. To be a human being, it is claimed that you must think and reason independently, exist independently, have all the necessary internal organs to digest, process and convert nutrients. But this is an unreasonable criteria. Some children are actually born with the majority of their brain missing, anencephalic. Yet no one would claim that they are not human. Other children are born with hydrocephalus, which is a condition that severely compresses the brain due to a major fluid buildup in their head. The argument that an embryo is not yet human because it could not independently exist apart from its host, that is its mother, it's quite unreasonable because it could be argued that any newborn child is, is similarly non-independent and totally reliant upon others for its survival. This can also be argued for the terminally ill and disabled who become dependent upon others for their survival. It would be unreasonable to claim that a newborn baby or an invalid is not human. Thirdly, some people are born without all the necessary organs that others are blessed with. Some children are even born with these organs in the wrong places. Yet again, it would be absurd to claim that these people were not human. The Washington Post recently reported the story of a baby born with its heart outside of its body. Other people are unfortunate enough to either be born with or develop conditions that deprive them of genitals, renal function or taste. Yet with artificial assistance, these people function relatively well. Curiously, the ABC interviewer who questioned the Tasmanian MLC asked him whether his incurable disease had affected his judgment in the matter of embryonic stem cell research. He said that it might have, but it was, an, it was important to leave religion, ethics and morality out of this debate and concentrate only on the science. I would have liked Tim Cox, the interviewer, to have asked him, why? 
but I suspect the interviewer's own confessed atheism hindered him from seeing why this might have been a problem. The MLC offered no reasons as to why ethics and morality should be left out of this debate, and I find it amazing that so many people simply accept such a criteria for life and death decision-making. The interviewer asked the MLC about the Australian Senator, Senator Guy Barnett, and his vigorous campaign to thwart therapeutic cloning, the embryonic stem cell research bill. While he expressed genuine admiration for Senator Barnett, he said that his arguments were not valid and would hinder those who could benefit from the fruit of this research, like those suffering from diabetes. Ironically, Senator Barnett, perhaps unknown to the MLC, suffers from this incurable disease. In other words, Guy Barnett is amply qualified to speak about these issues because they may directly affect him. The MLC criticised Senator Barnett's arguments that embryonic stem cell research held out false hope to sufferers of incurable diseases and conditions. I agree with the MLC that this argument is a very weak one against approving the therapeutic cloning bill because medical scientists won't know what they hope there is until they begin experimenting. This is despite the fact that Senator Barnett is pointing out the present reality of this type of research, that the only advances that have come from stem cell experiments have come from adult stem cell harvesting, where no embryos are used. But ultimately, this is not the point, and perhaps Senator Barnett should focus on the morality of cloning human embryos rather than the scientific benefits or otherwise. Does an embryo have a soul? Some Christians who support embryonic stem cell harvesting have appeased their consciences by believing that an embryo does not have a soul. They base this belief partly on the following reasoning. Firstly, three out of four embryos do not survive. God would not willingly waste a soul on such embryos, otherwise heaven would become overpopulated. Secondly, since God endorses the use of chemical contraception, that is the pill, which increases the risk of embryo miscarriage, God would not have invested a soul in these embryos that he knew would die before birth. Thirdly, the biblical genealogies never list the life from a failed pregnancy as being a person in the eyes of God. Does God waste souls on unwanted human embryos? But the Bible seems to indicate that humanity, a human soul, is created at the point of conception. The Bible stresses conception in dealing with the impending birth of babies. Now Adam knew his wife and she conceived and bore Cain, saying, I've gotten a man with the help of the Lord, Genesis 4.1. But as he considered these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary as your wife, for that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. Matthew 1.20 The psalmist, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, writes that he was conceived as a sinner. Psalm 51 verse 5, which says, For I was born a sinner, yes, from the moment my mother conceived me. To write this verse off by saying that everything is in sin because of the fall of Adam is a platonic idea, not a biblical one. Therefore, Romans 5.12 endorses the teaching of Psalm 51 verse 5 that a zygote, the youngest form of a human embryo, has a soul capable of being corrupted by sin. This is fundamentally a moral and ethical issue, not merely a scientific one. 
Medical science may well discover how to use embryonic stem cells to improve the quality of life of someone suffering, but at what human cost? What if scientists discovered that all 21-year-olds develop a revolutionary secretion from their pancreas that could save the life of millions if the pancreas, kidneys and liver were permanently removed from the 21-year-old? This, of course, is an absurd scenario, but I exaggerate to highlight the principle involved behind embryonic stem cell research. That is, it is immoral to take a life to possibly preserve a life. Therefore, this is not a debate about the potential health benefits to be derived from cloning human embryos for the harvesting of their stem cells. Nevertheless, this is still the main argument used by advocates of embryonic stem cell research. This is despite all of the therapeutic advances from stem cell research being derived from adult stem cells. Adult stem cells and stem cells from cord blood are already providing promising results in this arena of research. But like many medical breakthroughs, cures often come from unlikely places like penicillin from mouldy bread. Yet it seems that all hope is being put in the morally indefensible procedure of cloning human life then killing it to harvest its stem cells. It is bewilderingly sad that so many Australian politicians have been lulled into dismissing moral and ethical arguments against this practice and accepted that this is, the, is only about medical outcomes. This is not a battle against science and religion. It is a scientific battle to discover the effective cures that should be conducted ethically in a way that upholds the dignity of all who bear the image of our Creator inscribed in their own DNA. I take him at his word and be. Christ died to save me, this I read. And in my heart I 